So welcome everyone to another Transatlantic Poetry Broadcast. My name is Robert Peake, creator of the series. This is our last broadcast of 2016, and we're going out with a bang. We've got two wonderful poets for you tonight, John Clegg and Don Cher. Before I introduce the poets, I um, just want to remind you briefly about the format. So um, each poet will read about 15 to 20 minutes, and then the remainder of the hour, um, in the last half of the broadcast, um, we'll be answering your questions live on air. So if throughout the broadcast, or even now, if anything pops to mind by way of a question or a comment, um, you can tweet that using the hashtag TA Poetry, again, TA as in transatlantic poetry. And we'll be monitoring that throughout, uh, throughout the live broadcast and uh, picking off your questions. So uh, all questions and comments there are eligible to be read live on air. So without too much ado, I'm really delighted um, to introduce John Clegg. Um, his most recent book is Holy Toledo, um, a wonderful, uh, fitting uh, book to be reading in a transatlantic context as it's this, this wonderful mind meld of uh, the American Southwest where I grew up in England, where I find myself now. Um, his previous collection, Antler, um, received an Eric Gregory Award. Um, he works as a bookseller in London, and he's currently editing uh, the letters of the poet and translator Christopher Middleton for publication. Here's John Clegg. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, this is London calling. It's eight o'clock in the evening. The weather is gloomy as you like. Visibility is very low. Um, this poem I wrote in 2014, but certainly it turned out to be about 2016. Lack light. At first, we didn't call the dark, the dark. We saw it as a kind of ersatz light, a soupy substitute that shucked the hems and wrinkles from our objects. That was nice. Then, later on, we came to love the dark for what it really was, admired how, unlike a candle, it could fill a room. Unlike a torch, it focused everywhere. Unlike a street light, it undid the moths. Unlike a porch light, anywhere was home. Unlike a star, it couldn't be our scale. In utter darkness, we were halfway down. Then came the age of lack light, loss of measure. Darkness turned inside to cast a darkness on itself, though age would make it finite. Perhaps we're stuck there, straining in the lack light. Still, across the last however long, I've noticed something budding, vaguely sensed a nerve untie and reconnect itself. I think my lacklight eye is almost open. Um, unlike a, a lot of um, British people, I'm very fond of the Americanism cell phone for mobile phone. I think it's, uh, it's a much more attractive word, um, a great improvement, uh, but it sounds odd when you say it uh, in conversation, so it's nice to have a chance to use it in a poem. Uh, this poem is a short one called Signal. Signal. Her tracking microchips a rhythmic prickle, blossoming into a migraine after thunderstorms, or when the herd slips under the invisible circumference of a cell phone tower, posing as a bristle cone. Um, one bit of good news from the from the US. Uh, in a dark year, is ocelots continue to spread across the, the bottom of it uh, and upwards. Um, they look like uh, small scrubby lynxes um, and they get run over. 
Uh, a lot of people are doing roadkill poems at, uh, at present. Everyone seems to have one. Um, and this is mine, Roadkill Ocelot. Roadkill Ocelot. Hard to imagine sleek, except where she's been drawn back to the sleek bone. Scuzzy, says the daughter of the man who stopped to see what we were standing round. It fits the mottle, working camo, scuzzying her outline, must have been what killed her. Microbiome of the blown gut shimmers, overblooming on the tarmac. Her expression fluctuates, depending on the angle which you read it from. The narrowest surprise conceivable shades into are you sure? This sudden, massive joy. Uh, this is a poem for the um, bluesman and country singer Jimmy Rogers, um, who died of tuberculosis uh, in the 1930s uh, after recording some of the most astonishing, chilling music in the world. Uh, absolutely apparent from his voice is immense good nature, such a patently decent man. Um, this poem named after his best song, Tea for Texas. Every source seems to take it as read that in those days, Breakman was synonym for agreeable, that his yodel mimicked, lyrebird fashion, a train whistle's dip and wheel, its Doppler ripple through gaps in the rock wall. Though now it sounds more like a trick of the wind down an empty canyon, plaintiveness in his voice mistaken for plain good nature. TB in German translates as addiction to dwindling. The next train does not call at this station. I'll read a poem from this earlier book, um, Antler from uh, 2012. Um, not read this for ages. Um, Spell for an Orchard. Before the universe, there was the orchard. The orchard is the universe's midpoint. Each lost city was modelled on the orchard. All myth and history started in the orchard. Our apples banged the ground and that was thunder. Our trees put down long roots and they were rivers. Moss grew around the bark and that was forest. In the forest, Two-legged insects chittered, and it was blossom honey. They paired spears from torn splinters. They saw a sparrow. It was God. The real God is hidden in the orchard. The rat behind the warehouse is the God of rats. The wasp drowned in the barrel is the God of wasps. The universe will not outlive the orchard. The universe is larger than the orchard. Larger is irrelevant. The orchard is better. Our fruit dislodged the baby teeth of kings. Our cider vinegar dissolved their crowns. Our apples hang among the leaves like lanterns. Now choose and twist. Each one is worth a world. You dreamed that you were standing in the orchard. Your lover said one word, and that was orchard. You never found the right key for the orchard. Your house lay just a little past the orchard. You lay on moss, your legs spread in the orchard. You breathed the ripened air around the apple. That brooch you lost, you lost it in the orchard. Um. 
Now read this poem from Antler Two. Um, a short um, history of human development called Nightgrass. Nightgrass. Nightgrass by the hand into grain. Found bread and beer there, the flail and millstone in blueprint. So daygrass and man were plaited together, altered into a braid of cities along the delta. Nightgrass was waiting outside folklore. It spilt over stubble fields and burials, nudged at the outskirts. Nobody bothered to name it or notice, and quietly, a third colour wove itself into the braid. Daygrass put forward her grain gods to serve as ambassadors. Man agreed. We'd tamed language with writing. Now we could use it to praise. But nightgrass was thick in the cavity wall of the temple. It tricked us with scarecrows who'd wait till we'd turned round then beckon the birds. It got into everything. One autumn morning, we stumbled into the field like sleepwalkers and led grain by the hand into night grass. Uh, and it's now a year less a week uh, since the death of Christopher Middleton. Uh, the poet and translator in Austin, Texas, um, where he'd lived for 60 years. Um, a quite astonishing poet, um, since I won't have another reading closer to his, uh, to the anniversary, I'd like to read uh, one of his um, a short poem from my favorite of his collections. Um, Two horse wagon going by. Uh, the poem's called, uh, oh, uh, collected in this marvelous volume, uh, No Home Should Be Without One. Um, collected poems followed by collected later poems. Um, it just goes on and on, and there's still more. Um, this one's called A Young Horse. It now have gone. The warm night ruffled with screech owl feathers. Where can it have gone when the horse came to a call? The warm night with branches, haunt of moss, web of intelligence, the breath of a young horse cooling between fingers, the night vast with bunched stars simply blown away it was. The night murderous and milky. The night of old hymns and hot bullets, blown, blown away by a breath, curling between fingers. It flew between my ribs. It set a hollow throbbing between the ribs and fingers. A sort of pulse had shuttled felt as it wove and melting melting the shell this mortal man nocturnally hides in his temple void of presence with a wicket gate of muscle to shield from shock his hungers r.i.p christopher middleton um, and since I've read one poem about a, a wild horse, I'll conclude with this poem uh, about a lasso. Um, the danger of throwing a lasso is that you get your thumb caught in the, um, in the loop of the rope you make as you throw it. Um, and of course, when there's pressure on the, on the when, it, when whatever you're lassoing pulls back, that loop will tighten very quickly. And so much the worse for your thumb. Um, and that's what this poem's about, about the gap between this is about to happen and it happening. The lasso. That I had time to think 
I still have time, not to correct my grip, but drop the rope before the lasso fell and yanked away the loop I'd somehow knocked around my thumb. That I had time to notice I could think, and that the time to think in was reserved for thought, like hours in a monastery. I knew because I saw and still held on that I had time, time sinking like the rope around the moment's neck, and I had thought like slackness in the rope, the little loop that half a moment's tension would wrench true, that I had time and then the time was taut, my thumb, erratic firework, shot past, and in the time reserved for me to breathe, I swear my wrung hand tightened, on the rope. Thank you very much. It's thank you very much to Robert for giving me the opportunity to read, and thank you very much for Don, who's uh, to Don, who's set. I can't wait for. Good evening. This is London calling. Thank you, London, and uh, thank you, John. That was wonderful. That was really a delight. Um, and I have the pleasure of introducing Don Sherry. I sort, I sort of just feel like I could say, you, you know, Don, <laughs> because frankly, if you don't. You're probably not that into poetry. Why would you tune into this? So um, you do know Don. Don is the editor of Poetry. Um, his books in the US, Wishbone uh, and Union here in the UK, Squandromania, um, and recently making a lot of waves, um, his critical edition of Basil Bunting, um, which just today, in fact, um, won a uh, best book, uh, the book of the year from New Statesman. Um, his work at Poetry has been recognized with uh, three uh, National Magazine Awards um, and a Vita Vito Award for contributions to diversity in the literary community. Um, it's just a great pleasure to, to welcome him on now and let you listen. Don Cher. Thank you. And how jarring it must be to hear two American voices after John's wonderful reading. I suppose uh, the American voices will be grating around the world for some time to come. And that's why I think in what I do, I tend to torment phrases and sentiments that infest the American version of the English language. Other people have other projects, but that's what I do. And this first poem I'll read uh, is called I'm Crying Wolf. Um, I don't feel terribly surprised at the election results over here. I think so many people um, anticipated uh, things that were not ominous of good, as I think Keats says in a letter. So this is called On Crying Wolf, which many people did. I'm not going to live it down, but I'm not going to live it up either. Remember when you took us apple picking back when there were apples, when there was picking, when there was us, even though I didn't want to be home, I wanted to go home. I wanted to wallow in the marrow of another awful supper and dessert instead of knuckle walking through history with the angel of death who's all ears. I tell myself not to be ashamed that my bite is my bark because if it punctuates equilibrium, all it means is that I'm crying, but not wolf. This is a poem uh, from my book Union that I wear republished recently. It's called Dilemma. I grew up in the American South uh, in Memphis near the Mississippi, which I've always thought uh, divides our nation into two with a big wound in the center, with a big wound in its heart. Um, I think, sadly, we see that now more than ever, though it's always been with us. So this is Dilemma. At Shiloh, creek water spills, braided, dignified, full of memory like old shape note music. There is no sign of the future here, and the past, all murk. Dark rain drizzles down, slick as beads of tin dipper whiskey. The land seems drunk on it, ridge, path, and briar. Everything is wet, unhurried. 
The Tennessee River feeds young oaks, and it's a pleasure to see them. Nothing sings through their leaves yet. The bark hasn't crusted, and a pure high mist halos each one. My fire has died out, and the road back glisters at the ice point. Need sends me through unannealed wilderness to one of the dolefulest spots of ground on the whole earth, Memphis, where the past still hurts and gets sung about, where the Mississippi flows by without anguish, where I was born. I'll tell you something, the past it's going or gone, yet this isn't the end of it. We saw a big need and we filled it, but not even a war set everybody free. In the original catastrophe of our history, we became Christ-haunted, contrapuntal. We fought America in ourselves. We pitched a dilemma and it still heaves us around on its wild horns. Um, in in um, happier times than these, I thought lots about uh, the traumatic, uh, lots about trauma, um, and I and I discovered that it is possible to quite love trauma and the traumatic, and there's a word for that. I didn't have to make one up, but it's, uh, you're a traumatophile if you like the traumatic, and I suppose now we'll have to grow to love it even more. But what started me going was um, the song, uh, uh, I overheard a small kid singing in a bathtub, and as everybody knows, kids are better poets than the grown-ups often is not. And the verse that the child was singing went like this, we all take the anger we all take disappointment. We all take everything. So this is the traumatophile with that as its epigraph. If the dogs would quit barking, if the kids would quit squawking, if the cats would stop pooping, then I'd study war no more. If the via were no longer dolorosa, if God still cared for tithes of potsherds, if the magnificent mile were still mag, then I'd study war no more. If Adam were the first of men, if the underthought were not the self-holocaust, if busy curios would thirsting fly, then I'd study war no more. If we could unsphere the spirit of Plato, if you could ignore the knock on the door in a dream, if white noise kept away the person from Porlock, then I'd study war no more. If we could unsphere the spirit of Plato, if your butterfly were still a heart friend, if my mirror were too young to know God, if gentleness were the same as kindness, then I'd study war no more. If my first wife would call once a decade, if I were not the patron saint of neurotic women, if straggling bees would quit dying on my porch, then I'd study war no more. If I could get these stitches out sooner, if hurricanes ran out of the alphabet, if the furnace guy could get the heat going, then I'd study war no more. If the thief would close the gate behind him, if the pilot light would stay on, if our basement spiders could spare the centipedes, then I'd study war no more. If all the syllables in the world could put us back together again, if I had a life's work, what did I expect? If moms weren't so maxed out, then I'd study war no more. If I could take salt from the press of the sea, if I had that old cedar chest back with whatever was in it, if the natural consequence of moving for love were not bad credit, then I'd study war no more. If I could remember that quiet amniotic swish, if my stitches did not have so many itches, if they would not quiver in my skin like tuning forks, then I'd study war no more. I guess people know me mostly as the editor of poetry, which is a good thing to be known for. And I guess people uh, are starting to realize uh, things about Basil Bunting, um, thanks to the 
uh, critical edition of his poems that I have worked on. And some people might remember that I have also been a translator. And I translated the work of Miguel Hernandez, one of the greatest poets in all the world. Um, and as long as there is uh, trauma in the world, as sadly there must always be, then Miguel must be one of its finest and sweetest chronic chroniclers. He was never bitter in the face of much traumatic bitterness around him. And many people will know his famous poem, The Lullaby of the Onion, which I translated and read in a moment. Uh, Miguel was 31 when he died. He was caught up in the Spanish Civil War and uh, he was imprisoned. And having lost a child with his wife before he was imprisoned, and he was imprisoned for being a poet because poets in some cultures are very dangerous people. He had tried to have another a baby with his wife and the baby was born, but Miguel didn't live to see the child. And one day in prison, in one of Franco's prisons, he received a letter from his wife saying that they'd had nothing to eat but bread and some onion. And uh, Miguel's response in the thick of war and starvation and brutality was to write a lullaby, the lullaby of the onion. The onion is frost, shut in and poor frost of your days and of my nights, hunger and onion, black ice and frost, large and round. My little boy was in hunger's cradle. He was nursed on onion blood, but your blood is frosted with sugar, onion and hunger. A dark woman dissolved in moonlight pours herself thread by thread into the cradle. Laugh, son, you can swallow the moon when you want to. Lark of my house, keep laughing. The laughter in your eyes is the light of the world. Laugh so much that my soul hearing you will beat in space. Your laughter frees me, gives me wings. It sweeps away my loneliness, knocks down my cell. Mouth that flies, heart that turns to lightning on your lips. Your laughter is the sharpest sword conqueror of flowers and larks, rival of the sun, future of my bones and of my love. The flesh fluttering, the sudden eyelid, and the baby is rosier than ever. How many linnets take off wings fluttering from your body? I woke up from childhood. Don't you wake up. I have to frown, always laugh. Keep to your cradle, defending laughter, feather by feather. Yours is a flight so high, so wide, that your body is a sky newly born. If only I could climb to the origin of your flight. Eight months old, you laugh with five orange blossoms, with five little ferocities, with five teeth, like five young jasmine blossoms. They will be the frontier of tomorrow's kisses. When you feel your teeth as weapons, when you feel a flame running under your gums, driving toward the center. Fly away, son, on the double moon of the breast. It is saddened by onion. You are satisfied. Don't let go. Don't find out what's happening or what goes on. Uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll end with the poem of Basil Bunting's. It is said um, that it addresses people at a writer's conference, the kind of thing Basil loathed. All the cants they peddle, bellow and tangled, teeth for knots and each other's ankles. To become stipendiary in any wallow, crow or weasel, each to his fellow. Yet even these, even these might listen as crags listen to light and pause uncertain of the next beat, each dancer alone with his foolhardy feet. I'll 
I'll stop there. Wow, Don, thank you. Found that very um, moving and, and relevant in the context of the, the times we're living in, and maybe that's maybe that's always the case <laughs> in to some extent. Um, so I'll I'll start off with um, with a question from Victoria in in Cork in Ireland. Um, she's asked on Twitter. Um, First to Don, and I think there's a variation question for John in here as well. Um, so Don, you first, do you find it um, creatively crippling or actually inspiring to be a poetry editor? Um, are you an editor first or a poet first? Or how, how do you think of yourself and how do you make distinctions between the two? What's it like? <laughs> I don't know if those two have. I, I don't know. It's uh, <laughs> creatively crippling. No, I wouldn't use those words because that would make it sound like a bad thing. I mean, I'm in the service of other writers now and it's a wonderful thing to be doing and I'm very I mean I'm so fortunate and it's it's wonderful work and I love it and it does mean um, that I have less time to write I think no great loss to the world honestly um, so so I you know it's not really a problem for me it, I, I suppose it must sound like one I I probably read more poems in English than anybody on the planet we get 150,000 poems a year in addition to which I read you know books magazines everything and it's 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 a great thing to be able to do so it is ultimately to use Victoria's words it is ultimately inspiring Though I wouldn't say that it inspires me to write a lot of poems to add to the mix. It's just inspiring in the, the largest sense of the word and the most uh, wonderfully gratifying sense of the word. Wow, that's a lot of work. I'd, I'd love to see a functional MRI of your brain. And <laughs> right. Some days sign. you would, there wouldn't be a lot of activity sometimes, but I try to keep beautiful. it going. <laughs> or magical rainbow colored world of poetry. And uh, John, <laughs> So John, you you um, you also you you write books, uh, poetry, and you and you sell books, and you're also involved with translation. What, uh, so over to you with that. How do you wear the different hats, and how do they inform each other? Type of question. Oh, I love being a bookseller. I recommend it to uh, to any uh, to any poet after uh, honest dish work. Um, very light and easy going. You can. Uh, there's a, a certain amount, of, sometimes you need to bring up the chairs, uh, often you need to speak to customers, but they, they just, it just breaks up the day. And the rest of your time is more or less your own. And you can read the whole shop, and there's acres of good stuff. You see everything first. If you ask someone for a proof, they probably bring it in. Um, and I used to spend a lot of time... Uh, hanging around bookshops and uh, reading the new stuff, trying to keep up with what was going on. And it's so much easier if it's actually your line of work, if you're actually supposed to be there. Um, I recommend book selling wholeheartedly to, uh, to poets after work. Fantastic. Yes. And I guess you can't drink the profits up because after you've read the book, you can still sell it. So that's this is, don't tell anyone, but uh, this is certainly the case. It's, uh, I mean, I mean, Wonderful. Absolutely, We've got to figure it out there. That's that's great. I I think so. Yeah. One one thing that really struck me, um, kind of in both of your work, um, you know, Don, you were you were quoting from Down by the Riverside and and uh, ain't gonna study war no more. And John, in your work, um, you found the the beauty in a, a mutilated ocelot in Roadkill. Um, I think I think Don, you referred to Hernandez as as a writing about bitterness without bitterness or something yeah. like that. Um, what do you see as, uh, well, how do you do that? How do you relate to that? What do you see as the, the poet's role there? And is it any consolation? I, I'm thinking kind of of the American blues tradition where singing the greatest sorrows somehow also brings us a certain kind of comfort. Do you, do you relate to poetry um, in that way? I don't know if, I mean, poetry can certainly provide comfort. I do think that the best poetry gives us courage and it requires courage to produce good poetry and to live the kind of life that uh, I think we're going to be called upon ourselves to be living soon. Um, so again, maybe, uh, you know, it's not so much that it's a panacea for something or that it's, uh, you know, you know, like, like uh, stress eating or something. There, there, there's an American phrase I'm trying to work into something. Um, I, I, I think that um, we're reminded, we're reminded, reminded that um, 
you know, when people look back, they'll want to know what we were doing in this time. They'll, they'll have uh, history books to find out the kind of facts, the shilling facts even. They'll, they'll be able to look at photos or videos. They'll see images of what it was like, but they won't know what, it, what, what we were thinking and feeling. And I think we have a responsibility in some way to let that get into our work because people will judge us by the words that are in the poems we produce now. And at the same time, I think you're right. I think one thing about blues music is that it seems to be sort of eternally valuable and, and, and something, you know, that, that can never be dated. So I think that it's sort of, you do both at the same time, you're of your time and of the moment actually in which you might be suffering or seeking comfort, but that you're producing something that people can come back to and come back to again, if it's good enough. Wonderful. I've got nothing, nothing to add to Don's wise words at all, hardly, except for that I hope that uh, one of the things people in the future looking back on the poetry of our time can take from it is joy. Um, and I, I think about that line of Frank O'Hara's um, about parakeets bungle lightly into gorges of blossom. And I've just always loved that, that just disclosure of something unexpected and wonderful that, um, and I think there's this inclination to, to follow Brecht and assume that all singing in dark times is going to be singing about dark times. Um, but I think that the most joyful poems in the world, the most wonderful poems in the world are written in some of the, the darkest times and have, have so little to do with the darkness and so much to do with the, the permanent truths behind the, the temporary screens. I don't know. Uh, it's all so grisly at the moment. <sighs> well, thank you for, for bringing bringing some joy certainly to me tonight. So um, I, I really liked your phrase, Don, to, to infest the American vernacular, infest language in, in some way. Um, and if I read it right, and if it wasn't on a spoof website that I that I read it there, that I think the, the OED word of the year is, is post-truth, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm, I'm curious your thoughts on poetry's relationship to truth, whether it should, um, subvert it, dig, dig for a deeper kind. What, what, is, what is the relationship between poetry and, and truth? I think you touched on it a bit about yeah. what it feels like to be in these times rather than just the material facts. But it's, what is that you? It's an elusive um, relationship because I think one might decide from the question that poets or poems can tell you, you know, something that we would say, yes, that is the that is true, that's the truth, but that makes it sound like a rendition of facts and conditions, and it may, you know, poems do that. But I think it's a, it's a, it's a far deeper kind of truth, which is the kind of truth that we know is right, we, we feel that truth. If they're not just bald declarative statements, the po poems make great use of those things and are obliged to. I think that the kind of truth we find in a poem is a kind of truth we didn't know to find somewhere else. So it's in counterpoint, it will be now in counterpoint with post-truth. I mean, the, the strangest thing about that post-truth is it's not a word, it's, a com it's sort of a compound. It's, it, it's a compound that undoes, its, it undoes itself. Um, it, it, is a self, it is a kind of la the language of self-destruction, which is all too eerie and timely. Um, but I think, I think what, what the truth there may be in poetry might feel right to someone who reads it and will know that, but it's otherwise hard to say anything about. I mean, you know, the, the most obvious example is Auden saying, we must love one another or die, which would strike us as the truth, but he felt it was a great falsity to say that. We must love one another and die, we must love another or die. Auden gives up, you know, completely on the grounds that the poem in which that line appears was false. So the standards for this kind of truth are very high in literature and very few of us are probably capable of very much of it. I mean, if so great a master as Auden flinched at his own lines, uh, 
you know, it's going to be it's going to be hard for us. But that's the level of truth I think that we can talk about. Otherwise, if you're looking for just sort of statements, you can go on Twitter and you know, here's here's something that happened five seconds ago, a minute ago. Here's something that happened yesterday. So I go to Twitter for for both lies and truths and post truths. For poetry, I go to something I you know I don't even, I, that I'm not even certain of until I until it dawns on me through the poetry. Wow! So that that re revelation you didn't know you were looking for, but feels so right when you when you find it. That's, that's terrific. John, John, your thoughts on on truth and its subversion in poetry? Um, there was something that I think I read in a, a review in Poetry Chicago about um, James Merrill. Um, somebody said that uh, writing about his practice they said that uh, he was never really happy unless he was working in these areas of his own ignorance that he could fill in with his own lies and inventions and uh, shooting the bull um, and that he always needed to have some some gap between um, himself and the truth of whatever it is that he was writing and that he saw his work as constructing the bridge across that gap um, and I've always really identified with that that's um, I mean it feels to me like the things that I know about telling the truth are never much use to me in writing poetry and the things that I know about telling lies, they're immensely useful. That's the parts of my personal resources that I turn to when I'm stuck in a poem. And it feels terribly wicked almost, but uh, I suppose one just gets from one end to the other as, as best as one can. Um, I like that bit at the end of Brig Flats in the notes where um, Bunting says that this isn't quite accurate, but uh, it's accurate enough for a poem. The speed of light bit. Excellent. So some of the mechanics of lying bringing forward in a way a greater truth or reaching after one that maybe we can never quite, quite grasp. Um, another, another question's come in from, from Kelly in New York. She's just curious, any, any forthcoming books of poetry that you're especially excited about or, or looking forward to? Um, John, let's start with you. What are, what are you looking forward to that's coming up in our world? Um, very shortly, I think uh, in January or so next year, um, there'll be Alex Wong's debut collection, uh, Poems Without Irony, I think is the finished title. Um, and if there's everything I've read of his work so far is, uh, has astonished me. It's absolutely like, uh, like nobody else. He, uh, he edited the most recent selection of Swinburne and he's deeply informed by those unfashionable poets of the last half of the 19th century. Um, Swinburne, William Morris, um, Ruskin, uh, the only poet I know who's read, uh, Robert Bridges Testament of Beauty all the way through. Um, and he's taking these really unlikely influences and he's making something so lyrical and held and ah, it's an absolute treat. I, I, I really, there's no book I look forward to, to selling next year uh, more than that. But next year is going to be vintage for poetry. There's acres of good stuff. Um, there's the big Marianne Moore from Faber. There's loads of cracking debuts. Joey Connolly's got a wonderful debut. Chrissy Williams, um, Bear coming out middle of the year from Blood Axe. Um, Wayne Holloway Smith, who those poems in Poetry Chicago are just, just a preview of. I swear there'll be even better stuff in that book. He's, uh, he's a, a, a young lad. He's one of the good, good old boys um, with the sales pitch. But come into the shop if you're about. There's acres of good stuff. I can tell you're a bookseller. That's wonderful. Those are great <laughs> enthusiastic recommendations. Don, what are you excited about? I second that. Um... All, all, everything John said, but also uh, going into the bookshop because the, it's, we should really say it's, it's a national treasure, as is John Clegg as a bookseller and a poet. I mean, it's it's a remarkable resource you have 
Um, I would add um, to that list, I mean, there are good many good books forthcoming. There's one that I'm especially looking forward to and also especially dreading at the same time. And it's a selected poems of Bill Knott, K-N-O-T-T. -T. Uh, Bill Knott, I always thought of as one of the uh, greatest living contemporary American poets until he died. <laughs> and Bill had simulated his death earlier and a few years ago, we thought he was doing it again, but he really did uh, pass away. And Bill self-published his books, and you can still find them and download them legitimately on the internet. He wanted really to give away his work, and his collected poems can be found. Um, he resisted publication by a trade publisher, even one so great as uh, Farrar Strauss in the US, FSG. But that's who's doing the selected poems. Now, there can be, to my mind and taste, no really good selected poems of Bill Knott. Never so, so I'm dreading it in a in a way, and I'm also dreading it because I know Bill would have hated hated the idea of a trade press publishing a selected poems. He hated the idea that people would be winnowing through his work. Uh, but on the other hand, I'm especially looking forward to it because if it gains him readers, it will be it will be well worth his posthumous fury um, at the prospect of the book appearing in the form that it will. So so that's something that I've been thinking about a lot. Bill Knott's selected poems. Wow, talk about your your work no longer really being yours once it's once it's out there. That's yeah. Awesome. Um, so um, I'd love to just open it up if you have a, a question for each other. If it's something you've been you know wanting to ask about the work, about um, you know about yourselves, um, John. Any questions for Don? Oh, John, you're muted. <laughs> it's gonna be a very profound, but, but <laughs> very profound question, but not one we can hear. So yeah, try again. It was, uh, I've actually got three questions. The first is, can I ask a facetious question while I think of a, a sensible question? My facetious question for Don is, what's the large orange book behind you on the um, middle, uh, at the bottom of the first shelving, of the highest shelving unit? Uh, with a sort of square edged binding, hardback, um, very large piece of kit. Um, I wonder if there's a way I can point it out on the uh, on the thing. Um, I was wondering about that when we were in uh, the backstage uh, bit, and I. I uh, it, it, whatever it is, it looks incredible. It looks really substantial and uh, and fascinating these are people who love books this is this is for sure don if you unmute if you unmute and you pop up on the screen and we'll get a bigger view of your background <laughs> <laughs> i'm not sure can you hear me i'm not yep. I'm, I'm not sure which one it is i'll pull what i think it is off and then i'll show it to you because i think you might like it so if you bear with me getting up for a moment please please, please. <laughs> That's the one. Is it this? That. Let me see if I can. Ovid, Metamorphosis, 15 books. Is that the, uh, who's the translator? Hold it up a bit, Hal. Um, it is translated by the most eminent hands. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't know, it's and a my... reprint of the Jacob Tonson edition ah. of Ovid's met Metamorphoses. So, so I went so to the a lot of... superseded the Golding? I wouldn't say that. Golding, Golding is is best, I think. I completely agreed. I mean, superseded in uh, 18th century bookshops. Yeah, yes. Um, yeah. So, um, but this is quite nice. I mean, because you get to see, what do we call it, the reception of these translations into English of the metamorphoses. So I, I tend to find, I mean, I think, you know, I used to be a poetry librarian and it's a lot like being a bookseller. You sort of can find ways of getting things that are thought to be impossible to obtain. And so I spend a lot of time doing that. So it's just a reprint. It, it uh, is very handy. It's just a facsimile. 
And so the <laughs> eminent hands are in between these covers. So my non-facetious question is the actual process of editing the enormous uh, and um, collected Basil Bunting. Uh, How did you find that impacting on your own work as a poet? I've heard so many different stories about how taking on a job like that uh, affects one's own writing, from people getting completely infected by the by the one voice to people. Uh, I don't think that can. I, I, I don't think that can happen with with Bunting because he was so idiosyncratic and so so very much his own man that you couldn't. You couldn't be like Bunting. I was never tempted to, and his voice was in my head a lot, mostly uh, uh, castigating me for doing a critical edition of his work because he affected all his life to hate the prospect of a thing like that, that, that scholars and people would be sort of crawling like maggots through his bones, <laughs> you know? So I felt guilt mostly. Uh, the other thing was, I'm what, what uh, is euphemistically called an independent scholar. I don't have a university position or a teaching job. So I had to, to work on the Bunting book in addition to, uh, for the most part, in, during the years when I've been at Poetry Magazine. So it was really hard. Uh, it was really hard to be able to focus intensely on that and not screw up. <laughs> So I hope I didn't, I, I did screw up a little bit as one always does. There are a few, you know, things I wish I would have done differently, but on the whole, you know, not being a scholar with a say summer off or a sort of a research grant or anything, I had to do it when I wasn't working um, at my job. And so it, that was the, I mean, that was the most difficult part for me. Um, uh, but, but I think what I loved so much about Bunting was how different he was from somebody like me. So, so uh, you know, I don't have to have his voice in my head when it comes to my own work. Uh, I had to have it in my head when it came to his. That's really fascinating. It's, I always assume people end up uh, studying people that they sort of identify most with on a level of practice, but I guess actually it's, uh, well, I would, I mean, I would say one thing where there was a field of, of a possible relationship was, was that he was um, kind of a non-professional poet, you know, sort of a magpie, sort of a uh, iconoclast. And I mean, those are things that meant a lot to me. He wasn't a career, career or careerist poet in a lot of ways. And also, I mean, he was, he, he was interested in you know, his his own region, uh, you know, and the language that he found in it, which means a lot to me as someone coming from the American South, but at the same time, Bunting was a man who'd been all over the world, living in Persia and, you know, Tenerife and all, of, I mean, just every, he, he went out to Wisconsin and saw Lorene Niedecker. I mean, Bunting was really, uh, um, on one hand, like so many great modernist poets, a bookish person, but his life was filled in adventure, being a spy, apparently, uh, you know, and just, you know, being everywhere, kind, kind of a strange zealot of poetry in a lot of ways, knowing all the great poets of his time, and for the most part being esteemed by them, or arguing with them, or both, you know, so that's something that, that inspires me a lot, not in any way with regard to writing, but but more with regard to attitudes about poetry and toward poetry, that, that there's something liberating about, about his uh, idiosyncratic um, and, and irascible uh, personality. I completely agree. I love that about Bunting, that sense that you get this huge experience and then he suddenly turns back to his own, uh, his own digs and writes a masterpiece just and he couldn't have written that at the time it was going on, and he couldn't have written it when it was fresher in his mind. He had to have the experience first, I reckon. Yeah, yeah. Well, I have a question for you, John. <laughs> and it's actually, it's a question that people ask me all the time, and I, I suppose I try to come up with answers for it, but but yours would have to be better, and that would be, I mean, do you, what do you feel the difference is between um, American poets and British poets at the moment. In other words, we both between us know a lot of poets. I'm talking about our peers, really. 
you know, people we circulate among and know and whose work we care about. Um, what's odd is that because of things like this, the internet, social media like Twitter and Facebook, we, we, we come to know each other. And so there's a convergence that hasn't really been possible for a long time. It, it's obvious that our, our, our um, you, you know, that the character of contemporary poetry in the UK and in the States are quite, you know, they're, they're quite distinct and yet they're somehow converging. So do you have any impressions of that? As far as I know, uh, almost all the convergence is the work of almost one person. Um, Roddy Lumsden, the editor and um, and poet and workshop leader, who's just been for the last ten or fifteen years has been bringing groups of um, young poets in the UK into close contact with um, his favourite American poets. So, to some extent, the the, the canon of um, US poets in the UK at the moment is also a, a canon of Roddy's personal favourites, which which is marvellous. He's got uh, jolly good taste in this. That Brenda Shaughnessy, uh, D. A. Powell, and uh, these people are um, they're the people we get asked for in the shop. They're the they're the people that people are reading. Um, I agree that at the moment there's such a huge convergence. I don't have a sense of whether it's going both ways. Um, I don't know who's being read over there from um, from the British side. Um, one sees what gets um, what gets published, and you've been doing such marvelous things done to bring um, UK poets to a to an audience there. The the poets that I think it's important to be getting over there, but I don't know whether they're. Uh, being published beyond magazines, whether they're um, sinking in. Yeah, it's it's interesting, isn't it? I I often work a lot with editors of big presses over here. You know, we'll just have conversations. And I'll make suggestions, and there are poets, you know, like Emily Berry or Francis Leviston, poet, you know, just to name two of many, who I think should have book publications through American trade presses, and it's very difficult. Um, but I think we're working around them in Poetry Magazine and other magazines and also, again, the Internet so that, you know, if a poem by, by somebody like Emily Berry or Francis or a number of other people, you know, appears in Poetry Magazine, I, I just hear all the time how readers are excited and, you know, they yeah. can't get enough of it. So, I mean, you know how it is. Over here, you'd have to go uh, on Amazon probably to get a lot of those books since the British publishers tend not necessarily to seek out or succeed in finding American publishers for their books. I think it's possible. I think, you know, it's just going to take a lot of um, persuasion to get these guys on board because I believe that some of the most exciting uh, poets on the planet today are, are coming from the UK. And I mean, we'll, we'll get that news eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Likewise, I think there's so much. Um, I mean, it's not just American poetry. I I have no idea what's going on in contemporary German poetry at the moment, contemporary French poetry. I have the names of generations that are um, in their fifties, sixties, seventies, but I don't know what people in their twenties, people in their thirties are doing. Mm. I think. In the middle of the 20th century, there was an astonishing period for translation getting bought over. Um, and one reads individual poems, but it's so hard to get a sense of what the scene is like in these places. I don't know, I, I should love to see on both sides lots of, um, lots of publication, lots of distribution, lots of presses taking on people from all over. Our work is cut out for us. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> well, here's to that, and, and what, a, what a, I think, perfect high note to end on, um, <laughs> and how fitting for the, for the theme of this series as well. I'm uh, grateful to both of you um, for your work and your words. I'm very struck by um, your combination of, of humility and enthusiasm at the wealth of, um, of poetry. Um, on both sides of the pond, and um, what a what a really 
tremendous um, high point to for us for us to go out on this being um, our our third calendar year of the broadcast series. Um, so want to want to let you know what's coming up. Um, if like me, um, you you don't know nearly enough about po English language poetry being written in India. Um, then uh, please do, do, do tune in. We're very excited to, to be bringing on board um, our our newest partner, um, which is Red Leaf Poetry, and uh, the host Linda Ashok. Um, we'll be featuring Vanita Agrawal and Jennifer Robertson on Saturday, the 28th of January. That's happening at 10.30 a.m. Uh, on the East Coast, so a brunch time reading on the East Coast, 3.30 p.m. Uh, London time, so sort of a tea time reading in London. 9 p.m. in India, so 9, 9 p.m. in the evening reading um, in, in India. Very much looking forward to that. Delighted to um, have had our two wonderful poets read in such, such a rich, interesting conversation. I, I, hate, to, I hate to stop it. We could have gone on, um, gone on a lot longer, I'm sure. Um, but we have come up to time, and so this is me saying we're I'm taking a break in the month of um, December. We will be back um, back with you in January. And just reminding you that, you know, while you're spending time um, over the warm holiday season with family, don't forget your poetry family. It's a great opportunity um, in the month of December, if you have some downtime, to tune into the past more than three years of archives. You can browse transatlanticpoetry.com um, and have a look at the, the many poets we've featured over the years. Um, pick out a few favorites, make your own playlist. Um, and, and enjoy the, the richness and the diversity and the, the tremendous wealth of, of poetry, perhaps, perhaps now more than ever. Thanks so much for being here. We'll see you in 2017. Bye for now.